are found in the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5. I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome again to our online audience watching from around the world, wherever you are, to my prayer that the Holy Spirit will move upon your hearts as surely as he moves upon our hearts here within our congregation in Village Seventh-day Adventist Church in Bering Springs, Michigan. Uh, today I'm going to be looking at the second and third Beatitudes um, in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, yesterday we looked at the structure of the Beatitudes. In Luke we see that Jesus is in the heart of the Beatitudes. He's in the fourth Beatitude, the message being that our lives are to revolve around the teachings of Jesus. We also looked at the structure of the Beatitudes in Matthew, where we say Jesus is in the last of the Beatitudes, in the Beatitude related to persecution. And again, the message there is that are our lives focused on meeting Jesus himself? Uh, yesterday, we spoke about the first of the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And today, we're going to focus on the second and third Beatitudes, the first of which is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we're going to be looking through this Beatitude and the following one together this morning. Uh, we ask ourselves, why do we talk about the Beatitude? You know, as Adventists, we like talking about Jacob's time of trouble, and the little time of trouble, and the significant time of trouble, and the time of trouble in the end, and the time of the end, and the end of time, and we love talking about prophecy. Um, but just as important as knowing where we are in history it's important to know how we are to live in this stage of history. And in a polarized world, it's my invitation to all of us to refocus on the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, and particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, and in this seminar on the Beatitudes, because Jesus explains to us what it means to reflect our Heavenly Father, what it means to live out His character in a world that is yearning for manifestation and demonstration of His love for lost humanity. So I invite you, wherever you are, to bow your heads with me, and we'll invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds. So shall we pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for these teachings of Jesus. I thank you that we have the freedom to gather here today, whether in person or online, to uh, hear an exposition of what Jesus was talking about. I pray, Father, that the same Spirit who inspired Matthew to write these words that your same Spirit will move upon our hearts and our minds today, wherever we may be, that we indeed will reflect the love of God more perfectly, more fully, more beautifully within our homes, within our marriages, within our communities and our countries. I ask, Father, that your Spirit will speak through me, that you will anoint me, that the words I speak will be straight from your throne of grace. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer, because I pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So our first beatitude that we're looking at today is found in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4. And if we have the screen, uh, there it is there up on the screen. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Some years ago in 2015, it was my privilege to be in northern Iraq. And ISIS was conquering their way across northern Syria into northern Iraq. And uh, I found myself in the city of Erbil. Erbil is in northeastern Iraq. It was in what is known as the Kurdish Autonomous Region. And ISIS had just conquered the city of Mosul, which was about 40, 50 miles to the west of Erbil. When ISIS came to um, Mosul, uh, they gave the Christians 48 hours. They had a choice to make. You leave, you die, or you convert. And overwhelmingly, the Christians simply left. And uh, I, I arrived a few days later. There were really very, very few defenses between Mosul and Erbil. Uh, ISIS were no more than 45 minutes drive away. They were hunting for Westerners. And I was uh, spending time with some of the displaced people in one of those warehouses of Erbil. And I came across a lady sitting on the floor. And uh, she had a, a bowl of beans in front of her and some rice. She was sitting on a mat. And I uh, sat down beside her. And I could see that she was lost in thought. And so I, I asked through my translator, I said, could you just tell me your story? It's an important part of ministry to give people time and space simply to tell their story, to vocalize what they have gone through. And so she told her story, how she left with her husband and her daughters, and how um, when they got to the outskirts of Mosul, they were intercepted by ISIS. Her husband was taken from her behind a sand dune, and she'd never seen him again. They took everything of value off her body, her wedding band, her watch, her shoes, her glasses, and she was left with her two daughters. Her, they, her daughters were aged 10 and 12. Those daughters were also taken by ISIS for other purposes. 
and uh, she was now sitting in grief, overwhelmed at the loss she had experienced uh, at the hands of ISIS. Uh, when you're faced with such um, depravity and such evil, it's hard to know what to say. In fact, in the book of Job, it says that um, this is perhaps the most helpful thing Job's three friends did. When they came to Job in chapter 2 and they saw the extent of his suffering, they sat in silence with him for seven days. There are times in life where our grief and our mourning and the reality of evil is so immense that silence is the only response that we can do, to sit in silence in human solidarity with those who mourn. And this beatitude of Jesus, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, it touches deeply on the reality of human suffering in all of its forms. This beatitude touches the human experience of every human in our planet today, and thus it represents the fulfillment of more of humanity's hopes than almost any of the other beatitudes. So what does this beatitude teach us? Well, first of all, here in the West, uh, many people love watching Hollywood movies, and it is a tragedy, but um, Hollywood is built on our fallen desire to enjoy the suffering of others. Blockbusters are built on the assumption that people will pay to watch gory deaths, and the more gory, the more the laughter within the cinema. But nothing could be further from the character of Jesus. At the other extreme, our Western societies are built, uh, we have many social um, and pads and cushions because we don't like pain or suffering in any form. And so we have pain pills, we have dieting fads, we have exercise fads and so forth that promise to reduce human suffering. Eat all you like, never act wisely, never exercise, yet take this pill and everything will be okay. But this beatitude of Jesus, blessed are those who mourn or blessed are those who grieve, it has nothing to do with these fallen attitudes. There is mourning in our world because there is suffering, and God never created us to suffer. Yet through the divine passive, that's a, a grammatical way of understanding this, this beatitude, for they will be comforted, Jesus is telling us that God personally will bring comfort to his children as they go through seasons of grief. God looks to comfort us in the midst of our distress. God is not blind to our distress. Uh, when Hagar is driven away from, uh, from Abraham by Sarah and she's in the wilderness and she's, she's sitting and watching her boy Ishmael dying, there is a name for God in that chapter of Genesis, chapter 16, I believe. And God reveals himself to Hagar as Elroy in Hebrew, which means the God who sees. It means God sees us in our distress. God is not asleep. He is not blind. He's not elsewhere in the midst of the chapters of pain in our lives. One of the names for God is El Roy, the God who sees us in our distress. We also learn from this beatitude that suffering is an extraordinary teacher. Suffering can open the door to profound wisdom. When I first got married, my wife uh, was raised in the Soviet Union. When I got married, when we were married, my wife gave me a book for our first Christmas. It was by Tolstoy. It was called War and Peace. And uh, I thought, well, this is a nice book. And for the second Christmas for, our, uh, for our, my wedding present, my wife gave me another book by Dostoevsky called Crime and Punishment. And I thought, oh, maybe she's trying to send me a message here. Uh, for our third Christmas, uh, she gave me another book um, by, I think it's by Tolstoy, called The Idiot, Idiot Paroski. In, in Russian, it's called Idiot. The Idiot is kind of this, um, this religious simpleton who, who acts like a court jester, and everybody doesn't take him seriously, but uh, he can speak truths to people. It's called The Idiot. And so I said to my wife, uh, are you trying to send me a message through these classical works of Russian literature. She said, no, not at all. And the next year for Christmas, I got a book entitled History's Hundred Worst Tyrants, at which point I really started to become a bit paranoid about the state of our marriage. But the truth is, is that suffering opens the door to profound wisdom. We know little about the depths of the human spirit until we have endured suffering, which is why some of the Russian literature that was born of the concentration camps of the Tsars and then the communists is so profound in its understanding of the human condition. To become a refugee is horrible, but refugees very quickly learn what is important in life. It is not your house, it is not your car, it is not your job, it is not your clothes, but it is life itself. Pain rearranges our priorities, whether we like it or not. Great natural disasters do strike our world. We have tsunamis, hurricanes, and earthquakes, uh, typhoons. I remember one of our speakers speaking about yesterday down there in, in, in Guam, Micronesia. 
But as a broad generalization, and this is a generalization, and I've spent many years working in disaster zones, uh, earthquakes in Pakistan, tsunami in Sri Lanka, um, starvation in Ethiopia, and so forth. I've seen a lot of human suffering in my life and in ministry. I've learned this, that there's a striking difference, difference, this difference between the survivors of a disaster and those who arrive shortly after the disaster. Those who arrive after a disaster, such as an earthquake or a tsunami, are struck with, they're overwhelmed with the horror of the devastation. And it is true, there is profound devastation when a tsunami hits or when an earthquake destroys your town. But those who remain, those who went through the disaster, those who survived, they are not struck with a sense of horror at the devastation. Overwhelmingly, they have a sense of gratitude that they made it out alive. There is a difference between those who go through disaster and those who arrive after the disaster and only see the physical aftermath. We also see in this beatitude that the healing of human brokenness and alienation in all of its dimensions was and remains at the heart of Jesus' ministry. They will be comforted, is his promise to us today. Since in the time of Jesus, sin was popularly believed to be the cause of human suffering, Jesus' authority over sin was manifest or demonstrated by his ability to heal disease. If sin, is, if sin causes disease, um, then if, if Jesus has the authority to heal disease, that means he can eradicate sin as well. Jesus, it says in Matthew 8, verse 17, took our infirmities and bore our diseases. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is the only human, the only person, the only person in human history who is able to heal all of our causes for mourning, including alienation from ourselves, from others, and from God. In the book of Matthew, um, as you go through it, if you take the time to study it, there are three layers of infirmity or physical disease. The first kind of disease is known in the Greek as nosos. It translated as disease or ailments. You find that, for instance, in Matthew 4, 23 through 24, Matthew 8, 17, Matthew 9, 35, or Matthew 10, 1. This is a problem of the body. You know, where does it hurt? Does it hurt here? Yes, ouch. This is a physical ailment, like having bumps and bruises in the school playground. The second level of, of infirmity and disease is a problem of communal relationships. And the question here is who is to blame? You find this expression used in the Gospel of Matthew through the word kakos in the Greek. You find it in Matthew 21, 41, and in Matthew 24, 48. But the most serious kind of alienation and illness that we find in the Gospel of Matthew is, um, is, is, is uh, when Jesus has to bring uh, not just um, therapeuain, that means, that means to cure, we get the word therapy from it, Jesus provides therapeuain or therapy for nosos and kakos, that is physical ailment and communal problems. But when it comes to the most serious kind of illness, uh, the Greek calls it malachia, in, in the book, God, book of Matthew, we find that in Matthew 4.23, Matthew 9.35, and Matthew 10.1, Jesus does not just merely provide therapeuane or curing, he provides catherine, which is cleansing at its deepest level. So lepers um, experience cleansing. They don't experience healing. They experience cleansing because this is a disease unto death and it requires a deeper level of intervention from Jesus. Only Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, is able to heal all the various levels of human suffering, whether it be physical suffering, whether it be communal suffering, or whether it be alienation of the heart. And wherever we are today, as, as we watch this, this, this seminar, I want to invite you to open your hearts to Jesus as the divine healer, who indeed can bring comfort for all these levels of alienation and healing and disease. So what are the implications of this beatitude? Well, firstly, while we live in an entertainment-oriented society, and it is true, Hollywood and the mass media and YouTube and um, all the online streaming services, Hulu and Netflix and so forth, um, this dominates our Western society. The reality is that excessive entertainment only leads to boredom. It doesn't lead to joy. Entertainment leads to boredom and ultimately to a sense of meaninglessness whereas suffering reveals a depth of meaning that we may never otherwise achieve. And if in our entertainment we choose to revel and enjoy the sufferings of others, not only are we fostering meaninglessness within our own lives, but we are separating ourselves from Jesus, who never looked on a suffering crowd with anything other than compassion. 
Jesus never said to the disciples, you see this crowd? Do you see this suffering? Let me give you, let me feed you and you can watch their suffering and enjoy it for the day. Jesus never looked upon a crowd with anything other than compassion. And this hard-heartedness to the sufferings of others means that we close ourselves to God's comfort and the promise of being blessed by God ourselves. So if we are to experience God's comfort in the midst of our suffering, Jesus is inviting us in the beatitude to look with compassion on others who are suffering and to slow down and to take note of it and to minister where we can. The righteous mourn over injustice and they do not succumb to compassion fatigue. In turning a blind eye and switching channels and looking the other way, we are actually closing ourselves to God's blessings and comfort in the midst of our own pain. The more that we focus on our own need for comfort and ignore those who mourn around us, the more we close ourselves to God's blessing. And in actively bringing comfort to those who are suffering, we are actively opening our own hearts to the promise of uh, comfort that only God can give. And secondly, the one who is lashed by the storm is the one who is most grateful to God. While we are not to seek suffering, nowhere does Jesus command us to seek for suffering, we do tend to grow the most spiritually during the storms of life. When people make their New Year's resolutions and they think, what do I dream for in the next year? Most people dream, well, maybe I could have a nice vacation. Maybe I could finish off a project in the house. I maybe want to lose some weight. I want to feel better about myself. I want to get that promotion. We were looking for the good things of life. But if you ask somebody, when was the time you grew the most spiritually? It was not when they got the promotion. It was not when they got the new job. It was not when they went on vacation. And it wasn't when they finished the extension to their home. It was when they journeyed with their spouse through a cancer diagnosis. It was when they nurtured their children through an illness or a challenge at school. We grow the most in the difficult stages of life, and yet nobody asks for that in their New Year's resolutions. We want the good things of life, and we want to grow at the same time spiritually, but the reality is that the greatest spiritual growth is engendered by the reality of human suffering. The th righteous mourn over their own sin at a heart level, and they are comforted through the forgiveness that only God can bring. In embracing the world's brokenness and mourning, as Jesus did in Matthew 8, 17, Jesus is able to cure all who are experiencing human alienation in all of its forms. And so we're invited in this beatitude to maybe join with David in his Psalm of Penitude in Psalm 51. We admit that the most significant sin and alienation in our lives is not the externals of life, but it's those parts of our lives and those parts of our hearts where we have yet to allow God to rule, where the kingdom of self rather than the kingdom of God is supreme. As we withhold parts of our innermost beings from our Heavenly Father, we are actually alienating ourselves from our Heavenly Father and unable to receive the full wonder of his comfort and his blessedness. Jesus speaks a lot in Matthew's Gospel about the cardia. That's a Greek word. It means heart. We have cardiac arrest today. But Jesus speaks a lot about the cardia, that where your treasure is, there your cardia will be also, as an example, later in the Sermon on the Mount. Unless we open our hearts to God, our fallen hearts will be at the center of our lives, and they will bring nothing but that which causes suffering. As Jesus says in Matthew 15, 19, for it is out of the cardia, the heart, comes evil intentions. If God is not the treasure of my heart, of Matthew 6, 21, then I will be alienated from God. Thus to mourn for our own alienation from God and to mourn at the suffering of others requires the miracle of the new heart. And without this new heart experience, we cannot experience the blessedness and comfort that only God can give. When Jesus announced his ministry in, in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, he was basing his announcement on what Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 61. And we see there that, um, that mourning is turned to comfort by the presence of Jesus in our lives. We see that oppression is replaced by the announcement of good news. We see that the brokenhearted are promised that they will be, receive a binding up from their heavenly Father. We see that the captives are promised the proclamation of liberty. We see that the prisoners are promised release. We are seeing that those who would faint of spirit are promised a mantle of praise. We see that those who experience ashes today are provided a garland, a garland of flowers that they may praise God. And those who are experiencing mourning today are promised the oil of gladness and of comfort. You know, we, each of us, we experience life in many ways. I just want to use a simple example here. I want to encourage you. Um, 
Most people watching this, we, we use tin vegetables and cans at home. Uh, most of us have pots and pans, and um, I'm banned from cooking at home over one infamous incident where my wife was recovering from um, surgery, and she asked for vegetable soup, and so I went down to dutifully prepare it, and as I was um, scraping the carrot in, on the grater into the soup, I shaved about a third of my big thumbnail off, and it went into the pot, and uh, a copious amount of blood flowed in. I couldn't find it in the pot, so I decided to blend it all up. Uh, my wife uh, ate it. Uh, she asked me what the magic ingredient was and why I was bleeding from my thumb. I confessed, and since then, I've never been allowed to cook again. It's a great trick if you never want to be allowed to cook again. So anyway, most of us, we come to life like this can, all right? Now, this is a standard aluminum can, and uh, we, we come to church, we live our daily lives, and on the outside, we look nice and shiny and clean, just like this. And yet, the reality is that inside, there's a lot of stuff going on, but we rarely open up to anybody about it, do we? We have a public persona, we have a public image, we have a public face. Um, oftentimes, we don't even know ourselves what's in that can. We don't like to admit what's going on. And we have these public, shiny personas um, but uh, we rarely, we don't know who we can open up to. In these days of social media, you tell someone a secret and it goes to their 5,000 friends within a few minutes. There is no such thing as really confidentiality anymore, including sadly in many parts of the body of Christ. But when we turn to God for comfort, we find that God is infinitely greater and has the capacity to hold all of our problems. When we turn to God for comfort, and I just need to make sure I don't drip all over the, um, all over the, uh, the podium here. When we turn to God in our hour of grief, and uh, we ask for the promise of comfort, we find that we can indeed give everything over to God. When we give everything over to God, we discover we discover that God is capable of holding everything we can possibly give him. We discover that God is so big that he's not going to leak it out anywhere. He's not going to broadcast it on social media. God is confidential. He's large enough to cope with all of our problems. There's no big problem in our little life that's too big for him to hold. And uh, when we give everything over to God, we find that uh, he actually can drain the pain. And in the empty space that is left, he promises to fill that with a comfort only he can give. So next time you're preparing something in the kitchen, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are still required to cook, that is, next time you're preparing something in the kitchen, you look at those pots and pans, I want you to remember that God is large enough and big enough and safe enough to take anything we can give him. And he promises that as we empty out our souls to him, as we pour out our souls to him, he indeed can fill us with comfort, the comfort that we need. So there are some questions from this beatitude I want, I'd like to invite you to reflect on this morning. First of those is this, is there a form of comfort for all kinds of mourning? That's a question for us to ponder this morning. Secondly, may I, how may I bring God's comfort to those who are mourning today? Who today can I bring God's comfort to? Is there somebody that you know of in life that is suffering today? I want to encourage you from a pastoral perspective. As you seek to minister to someone who is comforted, who is mourning, God will bring you the comfort you need in your own life for where you are experiencing alienation and pain yourself. The best way to receive healing as a disciple of Jesus is to minister to those who are hurting, and in turn, God will minister to you. Blessed, said Jesus, are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And so then we come to the second of our Beatitudes for today, and this is found in Matthew chapter 5, and this is found there in verse 5. It says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. There it is on the screen. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, I think it's a fair assumption or a fair conclusion that today, meekness is not celebrated. Would you agree with me? We don't celebrate those who are meek. The, the, those who are meek are viewed as being timid or submissive, easily dominated. Uh, there was a very famous story. There was a man called Charles Keating here in the States who headed Lincoln Savings and Loans. 
And he sent an in-house memo before the uh, savings and loan scandal of the 1980s and 1990s. He sent an in-house memo to his staff, and this is what he said, and I quote, remember, the weak, the meek, and the ignorant are always good targets. Uh, this man, Charles Keating, was ultimately sent to jail for his role in the, the, the banking and the savings scandals in the 80s and 90s here in the States. But when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, what and who was he talking about? See, the Greek word land that he uses is ge. We get the word geography from it. And it mirrors the Hebrew word eretz, like eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And in general, these words in the Old and New Testament refer to land in general. They refer to the promised land or the land of promise. They refer to the inhabited earth, and they refer to the earth as the theater of God's actions and salvation history. And in this beatitude here, Jesus is drawing extensively on Psalm, uh, 70, th Psalm 37. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 37 to understand where Jesus is coming from with this particular beatitude. You see, Psalm 37 says this, But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The righteous shall inherit the land and live in it forever. So Psalm 37 talks about the meek inheriting the land. And uh, Psalm 37 talks about two ways in which we may live in the land. There are two ways. The first of those ways is through violence, and the second of those ways is through meekness. You see, those who seek security um, often manifest an excessive desire for power, for material possessions, and honor. And this results in various forms of worry and envy. Look at Psalm 37, verse 1. It says, Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers. Seeking to control the land through power often leads to anxiety. Verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil, de evil de devices. It leads in verse 8 to anger. Verse 8 of the Psalm 37 says, Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. And again in verse 12, the wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. This false sense of security, this false security that I'm going to own the land, I'm going to grab the land, and it's mine and you cannot take it from me, this leads to evil doing as a way of protecting our lifestyle as opposed to others. It leads to using forces within society to protect my position rather than to look out for the needs of everybody. The psalmist is warning against using such land-based attitudes against as the foundation of our lives. Rather, in verse 3, the psalmist says this, Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. So scripturally speaking, earth and land are almost synonymous concepts. But in Jesus' day and in our day today, we have separated these things out. How is that so? Psalm 24, verse 1, we're familiar with this verse. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That is the earth and everything within it belongs to God. And we'd all say amen to that. The problem is, is the Israelites had come to distinguish between the earth belongs to God and this bit of land belongs to me. And so even in our own day, we say, yes, the earth is God's, but this bit of land with my title deed, this belongs to me. and I'm sovereign over this bit of land. When the land is mine and does not belong to God, then we must defend it at all costs. And this leads to the inherent potential for land-based violence. And when land-based value systems are paralleled with concepts of national honor or personal prestige, then national leaders are all too willing to go to war over an insignificant loss of land. And so this is viewed as a matter of national honor. Within societies, violence is often initiated by one group against another through fear of loss. Some examples just within my lifetime, examples such as apartheid in South Africa, ethnic cleansing in Rwanda, uh, policies that load, lead to social exclusion and discrimination, often in the West, and regressive taxation regimes. These all come about when one group feels threatened by the loss of its control of the land with its productive capacity and wealth-making capacity to another group. At a national level, this underlying fear of loss or lack of trust in God for our national security serves as a justification for preemptive strikes. Now, in Jesus' day, we turn back to Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
uh, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria were inhabited by the Romans, or occupied by the Romans. They were men of military might. They were opposed by the, the zealots. Uh, they were also men who said, well, we're going to claim the land through military might. So there was one group in the time of Jesus who said that military might will ensure that you inherit the land. There was another group, the Pharisees. They insisted that the land was the Jews by virtue of descent from Abraham alone. But Jesus denies in this beatitude that the land will be divided according to biological descent or military might. Rather, the land will go to the meek. And the meek are blessed precisely because they do not require force to develop, to provide their own security. Their lives are built around trusting God. God will take care of them. God will meet their basic needs. As such, the meek are not consumed by the fear of loss which dominates the lives of the wealthy and the powerful. Have you ever noticed that those with extreme wealth are dominated by fear of loss? They watch the stock market by the minute. I've been in some offices where people have the, the Dow Jones index literally ticking along on the bottom of their screen. They have millions in the bank and they are consumed every day by fear of loss. Rather than viewing their wealth as a means to bless society, their whole life is consumed about pr how to preserve their wealth and how to diversify their wealth so they don't have to experience loss. So fear of loss is the paradox that accompanies having incredible wealth and when you no longer trust in God for your financial and physical security. So what are the implications of this beatitude? Firstly, well, according to the scriptures, we own nothing of ourselves. When we get into that stage of life where we have a condo, we have a holiday home, we have a tenured position, we live in a good neighborhood, we have a terminal degree, we have three cars in the garage, we have social honor, it is easy to forget, to forget that it was God and not ourselves who brought us to this point of life. We need to remember that the land is always a gift from God. It is an inheritance from God. It is not ours to take, but it is God's to give. Thus, we have no absolute right over it. We are merely stewards of what passes through our possession on a day-to-day -day basis. And our inheritance of any land depend, depends upon fidelity to God's vision for how we are to use resources to bless those in need. You turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We see there how God describes this responsibility that we face. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10, it says there, When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you a land with fine, large cities that you did not build. Then verse 11, houses filled with all sorts of goods that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hew, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you have eaten your fill, and we say amen at that, verse 12, take care that you do not forget the Lord. Take care in the midst of your material wealth, fellow Americans, people watching around the world, take care that in the midst of your physical abundance, Never forget that everything we have is a gift from God. If we start being ruled by fear of loss, this will result in social violence one way or another as we feel threatened by financial loss at a personal level. As, as stewards rather than absolute owners, we represent God to his creation. Look at Deuteronomy just over the page, chapter 8 and verse 9. God promised his people that when they got to the promised land, it says there in verse 9, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing. It is God's purpose for his church, for his people, that we live in a way that we order our lives that those around us lack nothing. God is not honored by poverty or human deprivation or want or need. God will provide the fundamental resources of life for his people. And God promised his people in the promised land all the resources they would need for the, so that nobody would lack anything here in Deuteronomy chapter 8 if they would order their lives and their economy after God's will. But when the land becomes ours rather than God's, when we're focused on the bottom line rather than God's will, when we forget that everything we have is an inheritance from God, we become self-delusional in our pride and we separate our pursuit ourselves from God. The pursuit of land becomes an end in itself. The pursuit of wealth takes precedence over seeking God's will. And it's interesting that later in the Sermon on the Mount, there in, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus specifically talks about those who worry about what they're going to eat and what they're going to drink and what they're going to wear. People who are worried about the, the, the material aspects of life 
He says, seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and I will take care of your basic needs. It's an invitation to all of us to reorder the priorities in our lives. The Greek word for house is oikos. The Greek word for a household is oikonomia. That is where we get the word economy from. The national economy is similar to the household economy. How we order our households, how we order our national economy is is ideally to be a reflection of God's will, that we take care of the poor and the marginalized, that we do not seek to use violence to exclude, but we use the blessings God has poured upon us to lift everybody within society. But when we operate from pride, we operate ultimately from fear of loss, and we are no longer counted among the meek. The meek work to ensure that they have all their basic needs met and everybody else has their basic needs met. The meek are those who challenge physical structures that perpetrate violence on minority or or, uh, marginalized group. The meek today cannot support structures or systems whose stewardship of the earth's resources leads to environmental degradation and displaces the poor and the voiceless. The meek ask themselves, is it better to have what they want or is it better for the poor to have what they need? The meek are invited, as was the rich young ruler later in the Gospel of Matthew, to use our resources sacrificially on behalf of the poor. While governments have social security systems, this does not remove the responsibility of the meek to share on a personal level with those who have not. Uh, Many years ago, I was working in a former Soviet Republic, and uh, my salary was $200 a month. I paid $100 rent. It was a war zone. There was a lot of refugees. It was a desperate economic situation. Um, I went down to about 110 pounds. So I was literally skin and bone back then. And uh, when I showed a picture of myself to my wife, she, she almost didn't recognize me. And, um, and so uh, it, was, it was a desperate situation. There was fighting between communists and, and uh, jihadis. And uh, people were desperately poor. People were selling their household furniture on the streets in order to buy a loaf of bread at the end of the day. And uh, one day I was walking down the streets, and I had, I thought I had in my pocket a um, hundred of the local currency. We'll call them manats, shall we? And I, I had a hundred manats, which was basically cents, a couple of cents. And uh, I, I see this pensioner, and she comes up to me. She's an old babushka, and she comes up to me, and you see the desperation on her face. Uh, the social security system had collapsed. Pensions were not being paid. She was selling a few um, old socks and a few pots and pans on the side of the street, all her household possessions that she had left. And she came up to me with her hands out like that. And I was busy. I was going places. I had things to do and people to see and places to go. So I reached into my pocket, and without really thinking about it, I just passed it on to her. And I walked on, thinking, it's just a few manats. It's a few cents. She'll get a lepioski. That's a round loaf of bread. She'll live today what I gave her. But as I walked down the road, I heard this expression of joy behind me. I wondered, what is she upset about? What is she crying about? I looked behind, and she was following me as best she could. She was a slow walker, and she was crying out God's blessings upon me. Pus bog blagasovitsebia. May God bless you. Zbogum, go with God, Sinok. Sinok means my son in Russian. And she was saying, go with God. May God bless you. Thank you so much. There were tears coming down her eyes. And I looked at her and thought, what is she talking about? And then she waved in my eyes what I'd just given her. It was my hundred dollars. It was all I had to live on that month. I'd given her enough bread for the, for the rest of that year. And she was overwhelmed with emotion that somebody had just given her a bread to live on for the rest of that year. And in that moment, even though she was from a former Soviet Republic and uh, she was uh, culturally from a Muslim background, in that moment, the presence of God was experienced between both of us. All she could say was, thank God, may God be with you, walk with, son, walk with God, Sinoch, that means my son. There was a connection there, God's presence was mediated by that act of kindness, unwitting though it was, and I've never forgotten that experience. Blessed are the meek, said Jesus, for they shall inherit the earth. When we act in meekness, we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, who later in this gospel describes himself as, I am meek and humble of heart. And so, blessed are the meek is an invitation to say day by day, may there be less of me and more of Jesus. And as I express the meekness of Jesus to those around me, I actually start to experience the presence of God in my life in a beautiful way, in the same way that unintentionally, unwittingly, I experienced it with that old grandma in the former Soviet Union when she received from me an incredible gift, 
and, uh, and she, all she could do was express her gratitude to God for what I'd done for her that day. Blessed are the meek, says Jesus, for they shall inherit the earth. As we come to the end of time, this earth is looking for a manifestation of God's character, a manifestation of God's character that will cross the polarization of our world, that will, that will seep through the boundaries of hatred and bigotry and prejudice we see around us, that will melt the hearts that are separated in, into political camps where nobody wants to talk with each other anymore. God's character is to be manifest in our world through a revelation through his servants of the goodness and the character of God. Blessed are the meek, says Jesus. They do not live in fear of loss. They trust God that their daily needs will be met. And because they do not live in fear of loss, but they live with trust in God, they can be a blessing within their community. And so some final questions for reflection as we wrap up here. Do I own my property? Or am I God's steward of those assets? In what ways do I and my family marginalize the poor and the voiceless? Do we take note? Do we stand up for them? Or do we just walk by on the other side of the road? What do the meekness and nonviolence of Jesus teach us today? And finally, what promise or invitation is there in this beatitude for me? Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount by talking about a man who built his house upon a rock. And he contrasts that with a man who builds his house upon the sand. And in our own lives, if you apply that in a personal sense, if I build my life, if I stand on sand, and that sand is sinking sand, the only way I can stand upright and retain my posture is if I push down those around me. But if I build my life and I stand on a rock, that is the teachings of Jesus Christ, including these Beatitudes, my footing is sure. I'm not afraid that I'm going to sink into the sand. When my footing is sure, I can now lift other people out of the sand. Blessed are the meek, says Jesus, for they shall inherit the earth. It's my prayer that as we live in these last days till Jesus comes again, people will see in us an expression of the meekness of Jesus, who himself is meek and humble of heart. And in so doing, their lives will be turned from fear of loss to a trust in God, and they will experience the blessedness that only God can give. May God bless us, and may he bring us the promise of these beatitudes as we live for him today until Jesus comes again. Amen.